biggest events we've actually had on Strive Academy over, over it's a peak personal best. 118 people have registered. So my name is uh, John Fagan. I'm the CEO of Scribe, and I'll be hosting you today along with my colleague Evan Parry. Uh, wave Evan over there. And then also a guest speaker, Julie Dunk, and I'll be introducing her later. So just a little bit about Scribe. At Scribe, we uh, build purpose-built software for parish and town and community councils. We have solutions to manage financial accounts, cemeteries, venue bookings and allotments soon to be released. So our tools enable you to reduce your admin overheads, free up your time to work on more impactful projects for your community. And all of this is gift wrapped with our, what we can now say, award-winning support team. So just to test the chat, we normally ask a question and I got permission from Julie Dunk to ask this question. Um, so drop it into the chat. What would be your perfect ending? Uh, like, how would you like to go? And, um, you know, do, you know, the topic is about cemeteries. So I thought it'd be a bit risky asking this, but uh, yeah, what would be your perfect ending? So drop it into the chat there. I'm not sure any of you act actually thought about this. Um, and there might be some fun responses. So yeah, drop it in. Ashes in a firework. Good. Drunk and asleep in my sleep. Nice. Drowning in a bath of chocolate. Oh, uh, yeah, that could work nicely. I think my one would be surfing a massive big wave. And, you know, that would be the end of me out there in the surf. Um, if the chat is annoying you, um, it will it will pop up in the bottom of the Zoom. Don't click on it. Otherwise, it'll keep popping up. Um, we have had people getting annoyed with the chat and taking over the screen. Maldives, yep. You'll have to plan that one pretty pretty organize that one uh, on the beach very good very good so um we're going to run a poll just so julie can get an understanding on the size of the kind of cemeteries you are managing so i'll just pop up that pop poll just there so we're running the poll there just to get an understanding of the size of your uh the the cemeteries you're dealing with and basically over the next 30 minutes julie is going to be teaching you everything she knows about cemeteries and compliance. And then after that, we'll be handing over to Evan, who will show you some practical examples of how Scribe can help you. It's just three to five minutes. So does that all sound good to you? Shout, uh, drop a yes in the chat if that's good. Eaten by Hippo in Kruger. Okay, nice, I like that one. Laurie. Um, that's a nice way to go. It certainly make headlines, I'd say, and everyone would remember you for generations and generations. Laurie, who was eaten by a hippo in the Kruger National Park in South Africa. Anyway, so I would like to introduce you to Julie. I actually met her at Lincolnshire AGM in October last year. And a, and a word of warning, if you meet me at a public event, probably best not to speak to me because if you seem very intelligent and enthusiastic and a fun person, I'm very likely to invite you or try coerce you to talking at Scribe Academy. So shortly after meeting uh, Julie, she seemed, uh, you know, she was telling me all about cemeteries and educating me and she seemed quite fun. So straight away I asked her, uh, would she come along and she accepted. So that was in October. So she's come along now to talk to us. I'm Julie Dunk. She is the chief exec of the Institute of Cemetery and Crematorium Management. She has over 25 years experience working not only in the private sector in terms of cemeteries, but also local authorities. So she is, I would say, more than qualified to speak to you today. Uh, she won't be using any slides today. She'll be just freestyling it. She's got a top 10 compliancy tips. Um, and uh, we will be, our team will be taking notes and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, actually produce a blog for you guys and, pub, and we'll share it afterwards. Um, so yeah, so, uh, yeah, so maybe we'll end that poll result. Whoever's controlling the poll, could you end the poll and then share the results and we'll have a little look at, I should get something pop up. It might not work for me. I might not be able to see the actual results, but hopefully you can see them. 
Um, yeah, they've just come up. It looks like we're sort of most most of the cemeteries here are between two hundred and a thousand plots. Two hundred and a thousand plots. Okay, cool. So there's decent size. Thanks for that, Evan. Um, yeah, and then while Julie's talking, feel free to drop any uh, questions in the chat um, so that we'll we'll do a Q and A after Evan. We'll do Julie, then Evan, and then we'll do the Q and A. Um, and also, we normally like people to ask the question if they can. So put on your video and, and come and do that. So, right, over to you, Julie. Right. Thank you, John, for that excellent introduction. Um, <clears throat> I'm a bit worried that I'm supposed to be teaching you all I know in the next 30 minutes. Uh, it, that implies I don't know a great deal, I think. Um, I'm just going to basically scratch the surface, really. Um, and just give you some top tips on how to comply. Um, it's really lovely to see so many people. Thank you for joining. I recognise um, some of you. Um, I know I've spoken to some and met some of you. So hello to everyone that I know and, uh, and welcome to everyone that I don't yet know. Um, I do. I am the chief executive of the Institute of Cemetery and Crematorium Management, as John said. And the Institute is um, a membership organisation and our main aim is to raise standards for bereaved people through the provision of training and education for those who own, operate and work in cemeteries and crematoria. Um, we're a very small organisation, but a very good one. Um, we're very interactive with our members and we encourage people if they ever have a problem, they can pick up the phone or send us an email and, and we'll be there to help. Um, we do prefer it if you do join us, but even if you're not a member and you need some support, give us a call. We're there for you. Okay, so top 10 tips. Um, my first one, it might seem really obvious, but um, I've got to say it. The very first one is that you must get to know the Local Authorities Cemeteries Order 1977, commonly known as LACO, L-A-C-O, Local Authority Cemeteries Order. Um, that is the piece of legislation that will become your Bible, basically. It's where you need to turn if you've got an issue, if you need to know something, whether something's legal or not, pretty much you'll find the answer in the local authority cemeteries order. So if you haven't already done so, you can download a copy of that. Um, if you just Google local authority cemeteries order, it will bring up websites and you can download a copy. It's not huge. Um, it's a little bit difficult to understand on first reading because it's written as a piece of legislation, not as guidance. So sometimes you might have to read something a couple of times um, to really get your head around it. But I do encourage you to do that. Take it to bed if you need to. Read it. It's like bedtime reading. But that will get you out of all sorts of trouble. OK, so know and understand LACO. There's also, um, in support of that, we last year produced a book. It's not a sales pitch, don't worry, but I'm just showing you that it is available. The Essential Guide to Cemetery and Crematorium Law. Um, it's written by our company solicitor. And again, it sort of goes through things. It, it covers crematoria as, as well. So I don't think many of you are going to be involved in crematoria, but it also um, covers cemeteries. So um, you can actually buy that from Amazon. Um, it's a print on demand. So you can just go onto Amazon, uh, follow the link and, uh, and get your own personalized printed copy. Um, so really useful to have on your bookshelf. Again, you know, if you get a problem, you can usually find the answer in there. Um, but as I say, any issues at all, you can always give the Institute a ring either myself or one of my colleagues and we all know, we'll help you out. So get to know LACO, top tip number one. Top tip number two is that LACO is, you can use LACO to your advantage. And one of the best pieces of, of, um, of LACO um, is under the general powers of management. So paragraph three that says, subject to the provisions of this order, a burial authority may do all such things as they consider necessary or desirable for the proper management, regulation, and control of the cemetery. And that's pretty good, isn't it? That almost says you can do what you like. Um, 
there's a couple of conditions. So you're not allowed to take any action relating to a chapel and you're not really supposed to take any action relating to an individual memorial unless it's to remove a health and safety risk. There's provisions later on that allow you to do some work on memorials, but what it doesn't allow you to do is go storming in and remove everything, basically. So there's a, a couple of restrictions. But other than that, you can set your own regulations. That's what paragraph three enables you to do. So your regulations are basically the rules for your cemetery. And you can pretty much say whatever you want in there. Um, obviously, these days, they should be customer focused. Um, so you don't want rules in there that, that you can't really justify. But they're your rules for managing your cemetery. It's always worth having a look what other people are doing. OK, you don't need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to anything to do with cemeteries. Um, people are usually more than willing to share. Um, it's, it's an amazing profession, the cemetery world. The people in it are lovely. You all do fantastic jobs. You all really help bereave people, which is you know, a real privilege and an honour to be able to do. I joined this profession. I used to be an archaeologist in my first career, so I used to dig bodies up. Now I put them back, basically. Um, but I joined this sector because of the people in it. They were fantastic and inspiring. Um, so if, you, you know, if you've got colleagues, if you've got sort of neighbouring town or par um, parish councils, chat with them, use them, share the knowledge. People generally are really willing to share. Um, also, Google is amazing. You can pretty much get anything nowadays. So if you're thinking about reviewing your cemetery regulations, just Google other people's, have a look what they're doing, and then you can adapt them to your own particular needs. When you set your regulations, it's worth reviewing them every couple of years or so, um, because you know they can go out of date, things change, people's expectations change. So it's worth keeping them under review and say at least every couple of years. Um, just have a look through them, make sure they're still fit for purpose. So that was top tip number two. Use LACO to your advantage to set your regulations. Top tip number three is actually a legal compliance issue. Um, you must have a cemetery map, a, a plan of the graves in your cemetery. Okay, that is a legal requirement. LACO actually requires you to have that. But it's also a really useful tool for you to manage the cemetery. You need to know where your graves are. You need to be able to have confidence that when you issue a new grave to somebody, that it hasn't been pre-purchased. You need to know that grave is available, hasn't been buried in before, and the rights haven't been sold to anybody else. And your plan is absolutely crucial for that. Um, I know a lot, of, a lot of cemeteries in this country were opened in the Victorian period. So the Victorians, uh, what an amazing time, but they recognised that churchyards were becoming full. And so they started to build urban cemeteries. And I think it's something like 70% of the cemeteries in this country were opened in the Victorian period and were still reliant on that provision. So the maps that go with those can be very old. They can be very fragile. They may have been on, on paper that is getting very thin. And, you know, I've worked in some authorities where the maps have got huge gaps in them and, and the paper crumbles every time you take it out. But it's a legal requirement to have that map. So if you're in that position, I would recommend that you, you get your maps copied. They can be scanned these days onto digital formats and they can actually fill in the gaps. So where you've got a hole or the map's worn away, they can actually sort of recreate that to give you a good current working map. Um, but without a map, I think you would really struggle to actually run the cemetery and, and be able to allocate graves. So make sure you have a map, make sure it's a good map. Yes, Karen, the, uh, the map can be electronic. It doesn't have to be a physical one, but you do have to keep it up to date. So every time that you have a burial, you need to really mark that onto the map. Um, and then also, if you sell the rights to a grave in advance, so like a pre-purchase um, grave, then you do need to mark that on the map as well. 
quite often we deal with cases where a burial has taken place in a grave that looked available on the ground because there was no memorial on it. The, uh, the burial authority has allocated it and then somebody has come forward and said, I purchased that for my mum for when she dies because it's next to dad's grave. And, you know, it's really difficult then to deal with that. So avoid that incidence, avoid that mistake, have a really good map. So that was top tip number three. Top tip number four is, is about your registers. Know what registers you have to keep. Again, LACO actually gives you a list of what registers you should be keeping. Um, so basically what you've got to have is a register of your burials. So whenever you have a burial, you should be entering that into a register. It can be a physical register, so it might be a big old book, and some of you may be dealing still with huge, great old leather-bound volumes um, that you have to be a weightlifter to, to be able to handle. Um, that's fine, you can still use those. Or alternatively, there, there was a, an amendment to LACO in 1986 that allowed your registers to be held on a computer, and obviously Scribe, um, and other uh, companies have, have risen to that challenge and have put software in place that allow you now to actually keep your registers as a digital version, keep them online. Um, it doesn't matter which you choose as long as you're following the local authority cemeteries order. And in fact, in LACO, it does give you a list of the headings that you need to have in your burial registers. So your registers must follow that format. So you have to have a burial register, you also have to have a register of what they call in LACO disinterments. We also call them exhumations. So if the burial is removed from a grave for any reason, then you have to keep a register of those. And that has to cross reference with your burial register. Now, some of you may never do an exhumation. Some of you may do several. But if you do do exhumations, then you should have a separate register. You also need a register of graves, which should relate to the numbers on your, your cemetery map. So the cemetery map and the register of graves should cross-reference without any problems. And you should also have a register of, of grants of exclusive right of burial. So where you sell the rights um, to a grave, the exclusive right of burial, that should be recorded in a separate register of grants. So they're the ones that, that LACO say you have to have. Um, the only other kind of specification in LACO is that if you're holding records from before LACO came into effect, so basically before 1977, you must maintain those as well. You've still got to hold those. And if you do any programs of memorial clearance, which you can do under, under a certain part of, of LACO, then you have to keep a record of any memorials that you remove from graves. Um, so that's the register side. Now, I know some of you asked the question before the, the webinar about forms as well. Now, there's nothing in LACO that's, that's statutory when it comes to burial forms. Cremation is a different matter. There's um, there's specific forms that have to be used for cremation, but for burial, you as the burial authority can decide what forms you want to use. Now, as a minimum, I would say that you need an interment form. So when somebody wants a burial, they have to give you certain details, um, which you can do on an interment form. You should also have a grave purchase form. So if somebody wants to buy the rights to a grave, they can fill that in and then you can allocate the rights to the grave to them. And I think you should also have a memorial application form. So if somebody wants to place a memorial on a grave or do some work to a memorial, then they can apply using a standard form. And again, if you don't already have these forms or if you think they might be a bit out of date or want to review them, just have a look what other people are doing. Um, a lot of authorities now have their um, forms online, so they can be downloaded, so you can have a look at them, see if you think it works for you, um, or if you think your form is, is fine, 
that's great, at least you've checked it and know that it's fit for purpose. Just a, a word of warning um, on what you call the forms. Um, my last job before I left to join the Institute was uh, at Bournemouth, um, which was a lovely place to work. Quite old fashioned when I went there back in the, in the late 90s. And one of my first jobs was to review the forms because they were very out of date. They, they, they looked like they'd been produced on an old Romeo kind of copier thing. They were really quite poor. So I wanted to update them. And the memorial form was particularly concerning because it was entitled Commission for a Monumental Erection, which quite frankly, I didn't think was really appropriate in this day and age. So one of my first jobs was to change that to memorial application form. So just be wary, have a look. You know, I, we know what it meant, but other people would be possibly quite offended by it. So um, just think on when, you, when you're naming anything. So know your registers. You've got to have certain registers by law. Forms are not by law, but certainly um, in terms of helping you run uh, the cemetery, then they are important. So top tip number five is about rights of burial. Now this is quite a complex subject, so I'm only really going to scratch the surface today, but just so that you know that LACO allows you to grant the exclusive right of burial in a grave to a person or persons. So you can actually issue the rights to somebody, uh, just an individual if you wanted to, or if there's people who want to have joint ownership, that's okay too. Some authorities limit the number of owners because it can get quite complex. Because if you had, say, six owners of a grave, they would all have to agree if they wanted somebody other than themselves to be buried in that grave. Now, that might seem absolutely fine when the family are all getting on, um, but the number of family disputes these days is just crazy. I think nearly all our, our probably about 75% of our inquiries are where there's been a family breakdown. And you know, when they when they purchased the grave, all was, was lovely and friendly. But over time they've fallen out, they've become estranged, and it can be really difficult then for anything to happen to that grave. So you might want to limit the number of people that you will allow to own a grave, um, but it can be more than one. So you can issue the rights. You can also decide what the period of the, the grant is. So how many years is that grant going to run for? Now, LACO puts a limit on that of 100 years. So as a, as a local authority, as a, a public body, you cannot issue rights to a grave for more than 100 years. In the past, rights were issued in perpetuity, which basically means forever. Um, but now that is limited to 100 years. 100 years at any one time, okay? So rights can be extended beyond 100 years if the family wants to at that time, but you can't issue the rights for more than 100 years. Um, I would recommend you don't go for 100 years because that's a very long time. I think it's probably best to go for a shorter period because after a hundred years, it's very unlikely that the owner will be alive. The family may well have moved on. It may be very difficult to find anybody in connection with that grave. If you go for a shorter period, you've got much more chance of having somebody alive who can take responsibility for the grave. You also um, can reissue the rights to that family and charge them. So rather than getting a thousand pounds for a grave for a hundred years now, you could charge 750 pounds for 50 years, and then in 50 years time, have another sum coming in. So it helps with kind of long-term financial income as well. So the, the, the actual period of the grant is up to you, as long as it's not more than a hundred years. And one of, the, one of the big issues that we deal with on a daily basis is transferring the rights of burial. We actually offer a training course on this, which covers 
well, when we were going out in person, it was a whole day's training. Uh, we now do it online, spread over two half days, because it's quite a complex subject. But it is important that you get it right. Um, LACO specifies that, that the rights can be assigned by deed or bequeathed by will. So if the grave owner is alive and wants to transfer the rights to somebody else, they fill in a form of assignment, which is quite straightforward. That's not too bad. Where the owner has died, it basically the rights basically become part of their estate and are then dealt with. Um, so if the owner left a will and it's gone to a grant of probate, that's quite straightforward because you can transfer the rights to the executor and they can then decide if they want to keep the rights or they can assign them on to somebody else. Sounds quite simple, but when you get families that are a few generations removed from the owner, it can get really complicated. Um, where you have families that are in dispute, it can get really complicated. So my advice to you is in those circumstances, if you're not sure, just give us a call. We can talk you through and help you um, decide how, how those rights can be transferred. So don't panic, don't worry too much about it. It is quite complex, but there are ways out of it. And there's nearly always a, a solution that everybody can, can live with. Um, so yeah, understand rights of burial. That was tip number five. Tip number six is kind of understanding what that right of burial means. Now, where the rights have been issued to somebody, that person has a right of burial in that grave. So if they die, they can be buried in that grave without anybody else's permission. It's their right to be buried. Okay. If somebody other than the, um, the owner of the rights dies, then the owner has to give their permission for that burial. And without that permission, no burial can take place. And that can be quite um, difficult for the family, really. You know, perhaps if, say, um, one of the children of the family have, has purchased the grave, they are the owner of the grave, um, but they've fallen out with, with the dad. And when dad dies, he wants to be buried in the grave with mum, but the, the child won't give that permission. So it means that dad can't be buried in the same grave as mum, which seems really unfair. But without the grave owner's permission, it's not going to happen. So where you have a burial of somebody other than the, the grave owner, you do need the owner's permission. The same applies for if somebody wants to put a memorial on the grave, um, then it should be with the permission of the grave owner. Now there is a clause in, in LACO that actually allows a little bit of flexibility in that purely for memorial purposes, not for a burial. But if somebody comes along and they're the relative of somebody buried in the grave and it's impractical to trace the owner, the burial authority can allow that memorial to go on. It implies no other rights to the grave, but it can help the family say, if they've been doing some family research and they've discovered a grave of their great grandparents, um, who died you know, many, many years ago, the graves are marked and they want to put a memorial on the grave, but they have no idea where the ownership would go because it's so long ago, then you can allow that memorial where it's a relative of somebody in the grave. So that does give a little bit of flexibility, but only for memorials, never for burials. Okay, so top tip number seven is about inspection of registers. I'm sure you probably all have dealt with family tree search requests. Now, LACO specifies that the registers that you have to keep should be open to public inspection, free of charge at a time that is suitable to the burial authority. So if somebody wants to come and search through the registers themselves, they can, but you can say where and when. Alternatively, if they want you to do the search for them, you can make a charge for that. And I know, you know some authorities do now make a charge um, <clears throat> because it can be quite time consuming. So there's two things there really. One is that the 
people have the right to come and look at the registers themselves. But if they don't want to do that and they want you to do it for them, you can charge them for that time. So it might be an extra source of income for you. Toxic hate relates to shallow graves. Now this can be a real problem. Um, if somebody purchased the grave for two burials and one burial has already taken place, so there should be space for, for somebody above them. And then when the grave digger goes to open the grave, they find that actually the burial hasn't taken place at a deep enough depth for the second burial, then that can lead to a real problem. LACO doesn't specify how deep graves should be, but it does specify that there should be a minimum of six inches of undisturbed soil between burials and three feet of soil above the top of the last coffin um, and the ground surface. So when you have your final burial in the grave, there should be three feet of soil above that. It does say that where circumstances are right, you can reduce that to two feet. So where you've got a really good soil with free drainage, a good loamy soil, it can be reduced to two feet. But to be honest, most cemeteries are pretty awful. Um, they tend to be built on bits of land that are no good for anything else. So quite often they're clay. You know, they're, they're not, there's not many where you can get away with two feet. So you've got to have that three feet. If you can't achieve that depth, then there is a solution. LACO does specify that you can actually build a chamber um, and then the burial can take place and you don't have to have the three feet of soil on top. But there's a very specific specification for how to build the chamber. We have um, turned that into what we call our shallow graves policy and that's available on our website. So again, if you get a situation where you don't think you can get a burial in the grave, there isn't sufficient depth, um, have a look. You can download the policy on our website or, or give us a call or drop us an email and we can help you out with that. So it doesn't always mean that you can't have the burial, but it does mean that you, you will have to follow the policy to make it legal. So top tip nine, is something that can happen occasionally um, and again there's a way out of it. Before you can allow a burial to take place you must ensure that the death has been registered or has been dealt with by a coroner. So you would receive ahead of the burial a green certificate from the registrar which is your certificate of disposal. That shows that the death has been dealt with by the registrar and it's okay to go ahead with the burial. Or you get the um, coroner's order for burial, which is uh, a white form. But again, that allows you to go ahead with the burial. Now, sometimes the funeral director will bring that with them to the burial. So you might have had your interment form, but on the day of the, the funeral, the funeral director turns up and says, oh no, I've forgotten the green certificate. Okay, now technically, you shouldn't go ahead with that burial because you've got no proof that the death has been properly registered. Now, if the funeral director is saying to you that it's, he's got it, it's just he's in the office, he's forgotten to bring it, um, and you know he'll bring it to you following the burial, he can sign what we call a Form 18, okay, which is basically a declaration by the funeral director that the death has been registered, they've got the certificates, They've just forgotten to bring it and they will bring it to you afterwards. Now, if they sign that, you can allow that burial to go ahead. OK, and the funeral director will then have to um, um, bring the certificate to you afterwards. If the funeral director is not prepared to sign that form, then you can't allow the burial to go ahead. If the funeral director signs it and then it turns out that it hasn't been registered, then the problem is for the funeral director to sort out because they basically lied on that form. So they would find themselves in big trouble. Um, the Form 18 is available on our website. If you go to the library um, and type in the search function there, Form 18, you'll be able to download a copy. We always recommend that anyone who's attending a burial, if you haven't had the green form uh, in advance, is keep 
a copy of the Form 18 in your car or in the office so that you can grab that quickly. Um, because what you don't want to do is delay the burial for the family um, if you don't have to. So that's a really useful tip. And then my final top tip, uh, there's loads more to be, I could go on all day, but these are just some that I think you might come across. So my final one is about the disturbance of human remains. Now, once human remains have been buried in the ground, they're protected by law. And human remains could be either a full coffin burial or it could be the burial of ashes. So in the eyes of the law, both are treated almost exactly the same as a couple of things that are slightly different. But if you've got bodies buried or ashes buried, once they're buried, they're protected and they shouldn't be disturbed without lawful authority. And there's two types of lawful authority in England. One is um, an exhumation license from the Ministry of Justice. And one, the other is a faculty from the local diocese. Now, the difference is that the Ministry of Justice exhumation license is required where the um, disturbance or the exhumation is from a grave that is in unconsecrated land. So where it's not consecrated, you would require a Ministry of Justice license. If the land is consecrated, which is consecrated according to the, the laws of the Church of England, then you would need a faculty from the local diocese. Okay, so when if somebody comes to you and says, I want an exhumation, one of the first questions you need to be asking is, um, is, the, um, is the grave consecrated or unconsecrated? Because that will then determine where you go next in terms of getting permission. The good news for unconsecrated is that the, the application for the Ministry of Justice um, is free. They make no charge for it. They're pretty good at turning the applications around these days. They, um, I think they commit on their form to some turning it around within 28 days. But if it's an emergency, you can contact them. And I've had exhumation licenses the same day. If there's been a problem, you know, if a, a burial's taken place and just after the coffin has been lowered, um, the family say it's the wrong grave, then you've got to do something quickly. Um, and the MOJ are very good at helping with that. And as I say, I know, you know, I've, I've dealt with some cases where they, they've issued an exhumation license within hours, so they can do that. Faculty, not such good news. There is a cost. Um, I think it's nearly £300 now for a faculty and the family would have to pay that whether they're granted the faculty or not. And the church don't always agree to an exhumation. With the Ministry of Justice, it's almost certain that a licence would be granted um, unless there's a specific health and safety issue or the necessary permissions from the family have not been gained. But no, probably 99 times out of 100, they will grant the licence. But with a faculty, it isn't guaranteed. It's up to the individual diocese as to whether that will be granted or not. So it can be harder to achieve. But you cannot disturb or remove human remains without that lawful authority. So, you know, even though it seems quite tempting just to, you know, if you've got some ashes in the way of the burial, that you will just dig down, move the ashes, do the burial, put the ashes back. You can't do that unless you've got the lawful authority. So don't fall panel of the law. Okay, that's my 10, and I think I've probably spoken for possibly slightly longer than I should have, John. So oh, that's um, perfect. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, hope that, so was that is Julie's uh, top 10 tips. I think we'll never have a, a guest speaker ever say this again. I used to dig up bodies and now I'll put them back in. So that's a great one-liner there, Julie. Um, Enabling, yeah, so if, if our attendees wanted to engage with ICCM, what kind of are your costs? What are your products and what, what do you do? You know, okay. is it free to um, get advice or what? You know? Yeah, yeah, we've got quite a comprehensive website which is available to everybody. Uh, www.iccm-uk.com uh, or just Google ICCM. Um, with the, with the cemetery and crematorium management, not the Institute of Care and something else that comes up, but uh, I think you, you, you'd be able to figure that out. So 
You can use our website. There's no charge. There's no restricted areas on there. Um, we do offer a corporate membership to burial authorities for £95 a year. And if you pay that, then you get access to our um, cheaper training rate because we deliver training courses on compliance, exclusive rights of burial, uh, managing gardens of remembrance, all sorts of different courses, exhumation, um, lots of different courses. And as a member, you get a discounted rate. We also do education. We offer a diploma, um, which some people sign up to, um, which is kind of the only qualification available to people working in the sector. And we have a team of technical advisors that you can contact if you get any problems. Um, as I say, we, we'll answer we'll answer inquiries to people who aren't members, but if it becomes uh, a regular thing, then we would encourage you to take out membership. Okay. But we're not going to turn anyone away who's in difficulty. Right. You know, that's, Thank you. that's the main thing. Good. So um, we're going to do our Q&A in a minute. We're just going to go over to Evan, who's going to just talk us through what we can do at Scribe. Yeah, thanks a lot. So uh, some of you might already be aware that Scribe do offer a cemetery management system. Just want to give you a sort of quick overview of what we actually offer. So couple of points that Julie's obviously already brought up there is that you must have a cemetery map or a cemetery plan. Um, we do offer that within the scribe system. I'm just going to share my screen with you so you can see a couple of points um, here. So just got my notes there. So within scribe, essentially the, the main part of it is it is a digital burial register. So you can use this to keep track of all of your different um, records. It is searchable. So uh, you know, when you have those ancestry requests, you can quickly search through them rather than flicking through the leather bound books. Um, there is the map, as I've mentioned, this map can be used to obviously plot out your, your graves, uh, empty plots, or those that uh, have remains within them. You can go to a map view here and I'll just quickly zoom in so you can see what it looks like. So this is the map. They are all obviously linked by grave number, as you can see here. So P106, for example, I can go into this and see my actual burial record here, which is for um, Jane Jones. We can see various bits of information about when she was buried. So this system really is, is designed so that you can keep track of your records nice and compliantly. You are able to do things like topple tests and inspections. You can see here, if I go to inspections, I can just generate a new inspection and uh, I can go through and do my topple tests within Scribe. It's a very easy to use system and it's very user friendly. If you are interested at all in finding out how you can manage your, your cemetery records digitally, please do let us know. Um, you can either put something in the, in the chat section on Zoom today or feel free to just send us an email uh, to info at scribeaccounts.com. I'll be more than happy to, to show you Scribe in a bit more detail um, so you can kind of look at the ins and outs of how it might work for your cemetery. Well, thank you, Evan. Also, on the mapping side of things, we're not 100% happy with our mapping at the moment. So I just want to do a call out for anybody, whether they're customers or not customers. I want to do a cemetery mapping workshop. We really want to do the, provide the best mapping experience, digital mapping experience for our customers. So we're going to be revisiting our mapping solution for not only cemeteries and allotments. So if anybody would like to, you know, help, you know, give advice and uh, input into what their mapping needs are and uh, experiences and requirements, feel free to just say yes, and we'll get back to you and uh, invite you along to an online workshop where we do that. So um, over, yeah, so, and finally on also support, um, additional support we highly oh great getting some yeses on mapping so I'll definitely respond to you guys on that um, if you need further help from your uh, fellow clerks and counsellors we also recommend joining these Facebook groups um, just dropping them in there so any questions related to anything it's really active community groups highly re recommend they uh, you join those um, so over, we got a lot of questions. We're not going to be able to get through all of them. How, however, I, I, I assume it'd be all right, Julie, if, I, if we send some of them afterwards and you could respond in writing and we'll drop it on the blog post. So Pamela, are you there? Pam, Pamela Hibbins, um, would you like to ask your questions or I can ask them for you? You've got two. 
Um, yes, I, I'm trying to remember what they were now, like because I sent them as they go. Um, one was just in terms of regulations. Can you hear me at all? Yes. Yes, sorry. One was in terms of regulations for um, specifically um, child graves, whether things like windmills and things like, and toys. I know it's probably an issue with a couple of people. Um, whether, whether there's sort of a standard, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear my children in the background, um, whether there's a standard to it or whether it's just up to the individual um, cemetery maintenance for, for us to put on our own regulations. Um, and the other thing was in the case of when I've got, for example, someone who's maybe mother passed away, they want, they um, now want the daughter, oh sorry, maybe the grandmother passed away, the mother's now passed away, they want them to be buried in the grave with their mum, they can't find the exclusive rights of burial. Is it a case of if they can prove the connection? with a birth certificate or something that that would be allowed i'm now going to mute myself because my children are in the background i'm so sorry it's half term here it's no worries pamela it's all, all normal on scribe academy so over to you julie thank you i'm, I'm also watching sylvia's cat at the moment which uh, is, a, is a is a problem is it a cat or a dog oh a dog sorry sylvia oh, um i uh, i have a problem with mine he's probably going to join us at any minute and the uh, I'm trying to keep him out, but it's really difficult. So, um, yeah, thanks, Pamela. Um, in terms of regulations for graves, no, there's no standard. It is down to the burial authority what they will allow. I know it's a massive issue with um, unauthorised memorials, um, and some authorities take a very kind of harsh stance and will regularly clear graves of things like wind chimes, candles, um, anything that's not within their regulations. Um, I, it's a really sensitive subject, to be honest with you, and there's no easy answers. With, um, with children's grades in particular, um, it, it's particularly sensitive. When I, when I went to Bournemouth, um, we had some children's areas in our, uh, in our cemeteries, and to be honest, they looked appalling, not because of what people were leaving, but because we couldn't maintain the section. So where there was lots of things on the grave, we just couldn't get in and cut the grass. And what we decided to do was to say to the families who own the graves that it's okay, you know, we, we understand the need to leave um, things on your child's grave. You know, the, the hopes and dreams have been taken away. All the gifts that they would have given the, the child during the child's life, they can't give anymore. So, Little things that may seem insignificant to us are really meaningful to people. So little painted stones that, you know, a brother or sister has done at school, it may not be a piece of art to us, but to them it, it's so symbolic. So we don't really want to discourage people from expressing their grief and being able to leave things that are meaningful to them. So we, we did a deal with the families, basically, and said, within this space of your grave, you can have anything that you like that isn't dangerous. So we wouldn't allow glass, for example, because that can break, um, particularly in winter where it you know, gets cold with water and then freezes, it will break. And that can be a health and safety issue. We also didn't allow them to encroach onto anybody else's space. But within their own space, they could have whatever they wanted as long as they maintained the grave. We would maintain around the area where we could get the, the, the mowers, but the actual grave space themselves was down to them to maintain. And we said that at any points where they felt they didn't want to come and maintain the grave, we could move everything to the head of the grave and then we would take over maintenance of the grave itself. We could then go back to grass cutting. And that worked really well because we didn't come down hard on the families. We didn't say you've got to take it all away. We showed that we understood, but we also had to explain that we couldn't physically get onto the section, onto their grave to maintain it if it was covered in, in their trinkets. So it kind of that kind of works quite well. Um, I think what's what's important is that you do need to be able to maintain the cemetery. So you can allow things to be placed on the grave, but maybe only at the head. 
if you allow maybe a, you know a couple of feet at the head of the grave that people can garden or plant so that you can maintain the rest of the grave without any any interference then you know that's okay but it is a real real issue but i certainly in the children's sections i wouldn't come down too hard because i mean it's sad you know all loss is sad don't get me wrong but particularly with kiddies and i know in some cemeteries they've placed um little um little sort of garden sheds or a shelter where people can put teddies and any other sort of trinkets that may get damaged by the weather um because to me there's nothing sadder than seeing a rain soaked teddy on a grave i find it really really difficult it breaks my heart so by you know having a, a facility where people can go and leave things that are not going to then be blown around in the gales or soaked in the rain you know that can have a really positive effect for people so i think it's short answer is yeah. No, yeah no standard regulations in terms of grave ownership um if if in your example grandma owned the grave then you would need to go back to grandma and see whether she left the will and probate was granted and if so you'd need to go down that line proof of family descendancy isn't enough i'm afraid um it is quite a specific process so where people left the will and probate was granted it's relatively simple where that didn't happen if there's no probate or no letters of administration or no will then it follows the the rules of um, intestacy um, and in those circumstances it's the next of kin who become entitled so if there is a surviving spouse it would be the spouse if there's no surviving spouse but there's children then the children become um, equally entitled once you pass the child generation it can get quite complex because there could be lots and lots of grandchildren but you can't you know they can't all be entitled so what we recommend is that the last surviving child it goes down their line otherwise you're just into into huge kind of complex areas but I would be looking for more than just proof of relationship. You've got to kind of, well, the family have got to do the research to find out whether a will was left and probate was granted. So it's, it's a hugely complex sort of area. Um, so if you, again, if you get any problems or um, cases, then give us a call, give me or one of my colleagues a call because we can help talk you through. Um, because it's really hard to have a standard way of doing it because there's so many different possibilities there's so many relationships and all sorts of things um so say so it's probably best to discuss individual cases if you're not sure give us a call cool thank you pamela for those great questions sarah hunt are you there would you like to ask your questions i am yes thank you um i've got two closed church cemeteries as well as an open burial ground and um, my question was do I need to have a map for the closed cemeteries as well because the local authority is now looking after them because the church seems unable to provide one apparently there isn't one so does that remain with the diocese the need to have the map or did that pass across to me um yeah if it's a closed churchyard then you because it's a churchyard not a local authority cemetery as such um then you wouldn't have to have a map for that if you've got one great but otherwise i wouldn't worry um especially if no burials are taking place because the need isn't so great um yeah close churchyards is i could probably do a whole seminar on, on close churchyards as well because <laughs> they can be quite problematic aren't they but no i wouldn't worry about that Sarah. thank you what is georgina berry uh you had a couple of questions are you there hello yes hello um Hi. so I'm just following on from what you said about the, the plots and the probate and everything else. So I'm probably being a bit dense. I'm not quite sure what that means. So um, we've got a few double plots um, that we've sold recently. Um, so if at the moment, I think they're just in the name of one person, but they have been sold as like as for the couple. So if that person that owns the plot dies first, that then presumably mm -hmm. means that the second person can't go in because they're not named on it is that right yeah generally 
So right. a transfer would need to happen. Okay. The other, the other thing you can do um, is LACO does allow you to add names to the um, to the deed to the grant. So then they're, they're not necessarily owners, but you can say, you know, I want so and so buried in the grave. Okay. So if their name is on the the grant, then yeah. they can be buried as well. Okay. But if not, just because. You know, I, I understand completely what you're saying that, you know, a couple will come to you and say, right, you know, we want the growth of two of us. Um, so the, your understanding is that they're going to be buried there, but legally yeah. they can't be buried there without the consent of the grave owner if they're okay. not named on the deed. So, yeah. Um, and so if so if that first one was to, if that, so for example, if they're married and the, the, the owner has passed away first and they've been buried and then so what does that probate bit mean? Does that mean that I'd like um, my mind's bubbled? Sorry. No, worry, no, don't worry. It's not, no sorry. It's um, basically. Does that, does that mean then that sort of generally speaking, isn't it? When that when one dies, it all gets passed to the remaining spouse. Does that mean that 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 plot passes as part of the uh, the uh, assets? I suppose not quite the right word, but no, I know what you mean. Yeah, no, that's fine. Basically, if, if somebody has left the will yep. and the, the will names somebody to look after the thing, so they name an executor in the will, yep. okay, that executor needs to go to court to prove the will, basically, so that the court look at it and go, right, yes, you're the right person to be the executor, and they issue a grant of probate, which is, is the executor's permission basically to deal with things like closing bank accounts, right. you know, administering the estate according to what's in the will. Okay. So when somebody comes to you with a grant of probate, you know that they've already been to court. So okay. you don't have to worry about anything else. Okay. If they've got that grant of probate, you can transfer the rights to them as the executor of the estate. Right. Okay, that's the okay. simplest way. It's when, when someone comes in and says, I need to do an ownership and they've got a grant of probate, you breathe a sigh of relief. So that's the simplest way of doing it. Okay. Um, and hopefully a quick question. So I didn't realise that plots couldn't be uh, granted in perpetuity. Um, so we have done a, a couple recently that are in perpetuity. So do they need to be reissued then for 50, 50 years or whatever the council decide on? Yeah. Um, yeah, basically you okay. exceeded your uh, um but i you know, how you handle that with a family might be quite tricky yeah so but what i'd probably do is is with those if they think they're having it in perpetuity i'll probably make it 100 years right okay of course it would seem unfair to go yeah you can have it forever and, oh no you can only have it for 50 years right okay but going forward it's worth thinking about the, the period that you grant them for wonderful thank you very much Right. And I won't tell him wrong. So don't worry. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Georgie, for great questions there. So we have run out of time. There are further questions from Lois, Joe, Harriet, Kay, Sarah, Lawrence. We will be sending them to Julie and she, she'll hopefully be able to uh, complete them in the next couple of days and we'll update the blog. Um, since we're not all physically present, please could you show your appreciation by wiggling your hand at Julie there to say thanks for all her help. It's quite scary. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, yeah, so everyone have, have a great day and um, see you on the next.